If you go, if you, if you take that step and you say, if you notice that thoughts aren't necessarily true, and you don't take the next step to notice that thoughts aren't coming from you, that you're not a thinker, right? then the thoughts that you have that aren't necessarily true, you blame yourself for because you think you're thinking those thoughts, right? So it's really important to go the whole way. And I, I, I don't really understand why they don't go the whole way. I probably think, I think they, they probably they don't go the whole way is because when you take that next step and you say, well, the thoughts aren't your thoughts, then it starts to bring the question up, well, you know, whose thoughts are they? Where are the thoughts coming from? And then, what, who are you? And they don't, you know, <laughs> they don't want to touch that question. <laughs> Which to me is silly. That's the question. That's the most important question of all, right? It's, it's to me, it's, it's the epitome of being silly. If you're interested in psychology, right? If you're interested in what's psychology, right? Psychology is the study of the, at, in, in this day and age, psychology is the study of the mind and the brain and behavior. The relationship between the mind, the brain, and behavior, right? So if you're going to study psychology and you're not going to deal with the most important issue, the most important question of all, which is, you know, who, who are you? You know, who is it? Who is it that's got, that, who is it that has a mind? Who is it that has a brain? What is awareness? So I, I, I don't, personally, I don't see the need to, to hide from that question. I think the reason that it's not dealt with for the most part is because you can't deal with that question scientifically, strictly scientifically, right? Because science, hard science, deals with that which is, can be quantified, yes? If, it, if something can't be measured, science can't deal with it, right? You can't experiment on something that you can't measure, right? You can't do research on something that you can't measure. So, awareness has no form, it has no weight, it has no quanti you can't quantify it, right? And so, hard scientists uh, won't deal with it. They won't, they won't acknowledge it. They won't even acknowledge that it necessarily exists as a phenomenon. Uh, they, uh, there were a lot of uh, conversations between the Dalai Lama and physicists and neuroscientists uh, over the last 15 years where they were trying to, to share information that comes from these traditional meditation practices and trying to relate that to contemporary science. And one of the things that the scientists in these meetings said that from a scientific perspective, what they're researching and what they're trying to see if they can um, verify is that consciousness is a function of complexity. So basically what they're saying is that consciousness, when, when, the, when the, the brain is compli complex enough, consciousness occurs, right? And if that's true, it would stand to reason that if a computer got complicated enough, that it would start to be conscious. It would have awareness. And of course the Dalai Lama thinks this is ridiculous. <laughs> But that's what the hard scientists are saying. They can't, they, that's, the only, that's the only way they can deal with it. So anyway. Of course, Arnold Schwarzenegger did say that Skynet became self-aware at 2.14 a.m. Friday, August 29th. So it's exactly what he's talking about if you watch the Terminator movies. Oh. <laughs> yeah, science fiction. So, good morning. It started to rattle before I even said good morning. Um, so I want to stay focused, though, in this class because uh, I don't want I don't want this to digress into something that that gets off point, in the sense that what this class is really essentially about is the practice of mindfulness-based meditation. The other things that I talk about here, from a psychological perspective, um, and the scientific aspects of it. I talk about those things because I think it's important for you to understand that the more you understand, the more you know about how this all works, the, the higher the probability that you'll do what it takes to practice it. So in a lot of uh, meditation classes and a lot of places where they practice meditation, um, 
they don't do anything other than get together and somebody says, okay, we're going to meditate for, you know, 15 or 20 minutes or whatever it is. And sometimes that's all they say. They don't even give instructions in terms of the technique. And other times they give instructions in terms of the technique. And uh, if they do, uh, they give the basic mindfulness instruction of relaxing your body and then pay attention to your breath. Uh, and whenever your mind wanders, bring your attention back to your breath. And that's the instruction. And then let's meditate. The reason that I, I don't do that, and the reason I think it's so important to, to talk about these things, to spend a certain amount of time in the class talking about these things, is because even if somebody does that technique in a class and, and considers that to be exposure to what meditation is, and even if that person who does that in the class and considers that to be exposure to what meditation is, it becomes interested in meditation and decides they want to practice it. The likelihood of them successfully establishing a meditation practice is very, very low. Because as you will discover if you haven't attempted to do this yet, right, on your own, right, it's very challenging, yes? It's very challenging because this is, this is, this is more difficult than almost anything that you can attempt to do, right? Because even learning how to play the piano there's the piano, there's something that you're doing, right? You're playing the piano, right? When you practice this, you're not doing anything. And for most people, that's inconceivable. For most people, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't even register. What do you mean? How can you not do anything, right? Well, that's what the practice is in reality, not doing anything. And so if you don't have, if you're not a student of meditation and mindfulness, if you don't get into learning about what the value of it is, how important it is, what the difference is that it can make in your life, in very practical terms, in terms of your behavior, in terms of your well-being, in terms of the quality of your life, whether you're happy or not, in terms of the common issues that people deal with, like anxiety and depression, Right? And one of the things that I say, and I think as a psychologist I have a right to say it, depression and anxiety are, are uh, pervasive. They're, they're everywhere. I'm not talking about people being diagnosed clinically, right? I'm saying that the, the number of people who are dealing with some degree of depression and anxiety that's, that is causing them dysfunction that is disturbing the quality of your life, that's affecting their relationships, that's affecting your effectiveness in living your life, in my opinion, especially in this country, is in the 90 percentile. That's why addiction is such an issue, right? Because why, do you, why are people taking drugs and drinking alcohol? Escape. To escape from what? Well, yeah, it starts, it's, it starts to, it becomes life, right? Because it, it, escaping from life, if you're depressed or you're overly anxious, you don't want to leave the house, right? You can't deal with anything. You, don't, you can't tolerate anything. It's affecting your functioning. You feel self-conscious. Self and so, yeah, it starts to make your life smaller and smaller. And then the other thing that becomes insidious about it is that, uh, and this is even more pervasive, I think, than depression and anxiety, is that the thing that people are escaping the most, and I don't think that they're doing it with awareness. If, you, if, you're doing it with, if you were doing it with awareness, you wouldn't want to do it at all. But the thing that people escape the most is themselves, right? That's why people don't like being alone, because being alone means you're with you. <laughs> you, don't, you don't want that experience, right? <laughs> That's why mind wandering, why do you think, you know, they say in the brain science, you know, a wandering mind, an, a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. Why? Why is a wandering mind an unhappy mind? Why is it when your mind wanders, it's not a good thing? So, yeah, so when your mind wanders, what happens in your mind? Well, that's, yeah, when you're doing that, you're trying to avoid what happens when your mind wanders, right? By giving your attention to just anything, right? Just people watch TV, they don't care what's on it, <laughs> right? 
Yeah, well, I think you're thinking closer than that yours. That's well, see, that's a smart right answer because you're a person who's been to the class and you started to consider the possibility, right? But for most people, their thoughts are theirs, right? Which is worse. <laughs> So when the mind wanders, and what brain science has established is when the mind wanders, the reason that that's not a good thing is because when it's left to its own device, when it wanders, it focuses on you. It starts to worry. It starts to ruminate. You know, what's going to happen to me? What happened to me? What will happen to me? What do I want? What do I not want? And it goes on and on and on and on. That's the program. So a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. And then the thing that complicates that is most people don't, most people don't even have the distinction wandering mind. Most people don't think their mind's wandering, they think they're thinking, yes? Right, so if, if it's not that my mind's wandering, but rather it's me thinking, and what I'm thinking all the time is negative things that could happen or have happened about me, or what I want or what I don't want, right? Then what kind of a relationship do I have with myself? So you can see that it starts to become, you know, the, it starts to become a, a process, and again, this is not necessarily conscious, but it becomes, starts to become a process of getting, trying to get away from that, right? Which is trying to get away from yourself because you consider it to be you thinking, right? And you could see it here, you know, uh, in the, out there on the floor, um, uh, where people are exercising, right? People, People don't want to be there for the exercising. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? They want that. So we have a TV every, every three feet to watch, or you have earbuds in and you're listening to music or whatever. Something to distract you, right? From what? From the experience of exercising, right? From the experience of, of having a body, from the experience of experiencing the body. So the practice of mindfulness meditation is the practice, in a, in a sense, you could talk about mindfulness meditation as the practice of waking up. It's the practice of paying attention, if you pay, and if you pay attention, you will be more aware. If you pay attention, you start to see things more clearly as they actually are, instead of thinking about things. And this is a major distinction. Most people think a, 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 an effective way to live your life is to be thoughtful, yes? An effective way to live your life is to be thoughtful. Think about things, think about it. Give me, a, wait a minute, I wanna think about it. I'll be back to you, I wanna think about it, right? And so thinking is a way that people, it's the common, ordinary, typical, run-of-the-mill way that people interact with life, right? They think about everything, right? To me, that makes me think instead of reacting, you're thinking about it and you're responding appropriately. No? Well, wait a minute. When you said, let me think about it, yeah. instead of reacting to something, you're, you're, you're pondering it and then you're going to respond in an appropriate manner. Well, yeah, that's a good point. I'm not saying that thinking is always bad, right? I'm not saying that thinking isn't useful, right? And there are a lot of times to think about something before you act can be useful, right? What I'm saying is that there is something that is more powerful than thinking about things, and there's something that can't, that thinking, there, thinking about things is limited, right? Think, thinking about things has limitations. When you practice mindfulness, when you practice meditation, you're practicing being present. You're practicing being with what's happening, not thinking about what's happening. Right? So when you think about what's happening, it's not that thinking's bad, but it's much more limited than being aware of what's happening. When you think about what's happening, you can only think about what's happening in terms of what you're capable of thinking. What your interpretation is? Yeah, what, yeah, what you're capable, you're thinking, what your thinking uses is the information that you have stored in your brain. Oh, if you've got junk in there, then you've got, <laughs> Well, that's one of the problems with thinking, if you know, if you've got, 
if you garbage in, garbage out, right? So that's one of the limitations of thinking, right? But there's a difference between that and practicing being aware and being mindful because if you're being with something and you're not and you're practicing and you have the and you and you're able to make a distinction between thinking and being with things, if you're being with something, you're no longer trying to analyze it or figure it out. What you're doing is just noticing what it is. It's much more direct, you see. When a professional tennis player is standing there to receive the serve, right? That ball is coming across the net at 130 miles an hour. Do you think that person trains themselves to think about what to do then? You can't. You can't do it, right? So this is another way that you can understand the power of awareness. Awareness has intelligence. Awareness has the ability to uh, respond immediately to what's going on. And we don't have, an, we don't have much experience utilizing that, right? We're, we're more prone to want to think about everything, right? We don't have a lot of experience using that, and we don't notice that that's the case for the most part, so it gets unused, it gets undeveloped, it's not cultivated, right? We don't necessarily trust it, right? We don't necessarily trust just responding to what's going on, we would rather want, we'd rather figure it out first, right? So, so, yeah. So do you think people that have a more scientific brain, the trained in the sciences versus like a creative brain, have a harder time being present and analyze and do all that thinking more? Like right brain versus left brain, are some people more prone to you know, being well, present? I think, gen I mean, first of all, generally speaking, most people aren't prone to being present. That explains the, the human condition. That explains why humanity, you know, generally speaking, is in not too good shape, right? And then I think people who are conventionally scientific, right, as I said before, you know, they, they still follow the, 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 the idea that Descartes had, you know, that Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. Right? In, in anybody who's kept up with things, kept up with the science and the neuroscience knows that that's just not true. And, and it's amazing to me that somebody could come up with that statement and everybody just falls in line with it without noticing what's obvious is that if, if you weren't there first, you couldn't think. So how could it be you think, therefore you are? So now we know it's pretty clear that awareness is first then thinking. You see, awareness is first. And that awareness isn't stupid. That awareness is not unintelligent. In fact, the awareness has at its disposal all available information. We don't trust that, right? We want to learn and know and use that knowledge to think. And yet, the evidence for that being the case is around. That's what I meant when I said about the, the professional tennis player. Um, what was the statement you made the other day about reality is based on agreement or something like yeah, that? Yeah, the, what is this, what did you say? reality is based on agreement. Everything, the world, the world that shows up for you when you learn language, right, as a child, the world that shows up for you, everything in that world that you learn is what it is by agreement. Everybody agrees this is a chair. That's why it's a chair. Right? So that's true about everything, you know, agreement, reality is a function of agreement. Some of the, some aspects of reality, it's obvious, to, you can see that it, obviously like a piece of, a, a certain piece of paper with certain markings on it is considered valuable, right? Like money. It's, it's just a piece of paper. It's the agreement that has it have value. Uh, diamonds are just rocks, but it's the agreement that has it have value. And scarcity, everybody agrees, is anything that's scarce has value, right? So that one of the things that they do, they do with diamonds is make sure there's not too many around. <laughs> so that's an important thing to understand, that reality is a function of agreement. If you go other places in the world, right, what's considered reality here is not the same thing there. You can go to other places in the world and uh, things are different. Everybody there agrees on things being different. 
I, I have a question though. Like, I'm, I get it that we are awareness, but I'm not clear on each of our individual awarenesses is one with the master, uh, the source, the absolute awareness. Do you envision it that way? That we're all no. <clears throat> you don't see it that way? No. No, because you see, and you know, that, that's an area that I would advise you to listen to Paul Hederman's rap, right? Paul Hederman is a, is a teacher that's, a, you can go online and YouTube and listen to his, he talks specifically about what you're talking about, right? And um, the problem with what you just said, and I understand what you mean when you say it, right, is that in non-dual teaching, right, which is a high teaching, right, non-dual teaching, right? They don't say everything is one, they say not two, right? So it's not like you and the absolute are one, right? There is no you. So there, there is, nothing has to come together, nothing was ever separate. So it's all one. Yeah. But that's, you know, as far as meditation and mindfulness practice is concerned, I'd rather you focus on your daily dog shit stuff. <laughs> You know, if you get better, if you have a better life in terms of the practical aspects of your life, right, and you get that going well, right, and then you want to go on and, you know, get into some high order stuff, you know, then you can get into non-duality.